Sabertooth cats have been around for a while. They're long gone now, of course, but they have independently popped up many times over the last 66 million years. The most recent crop were the dirk-toothed cats, like the homotherium, and the saber-toothed cats, the smilodontines. The saber-toothed cats took the large canine thing to a whole new level, with canines up to 11 inches or 28 centimeters long which comes with a lot of biological or physiological constraints. How did they play, or play fight with one another, or just fight without killing each other? Well, a recent fossil find might show that sometimes they just killed each other. Everyone knows what the saber-toothed cat is, Smilodon, the one with the biggest teethies. They were bear-sized, bear-proportioned cats that are technically not even part of the modern family of cats, the Felinae. They are still felids, of course, members of the Felidae, so they are technically still a type of cat, but don't fall into the group that remains alive today that we have colloquially named cats, a funny little distinction that amuses pretty much just me. Smilodon itself was quite characteristic of the Pleistocene-aged fauna of the American continents. They were incredibly widespread, not unlike the Puma Cougar Mountain Lion Catamount Panther of today, being found from Canada to Argentina, with a total of three accepted species so far known to science. The anatomy of Smilodon is extremely well understood compared to other fossil organisms due to its abundance. Hundreds, maybe thousands of specimens are known. The most obvious and amazing feature of this animal is its big ol' fangs. For as much of Smilodon that is currently understood, the precise nature of their killing bite and the bite mechanics themselves remains under much debate. How the hell did they get their mouths open enough to kill things? Not exactly the premise of this video, so stay tuned for something on that someday. It seems that at least some Smilodons used their fangs like a quick kill can opener. They went for the head to make the most efficient bite possible. The proof is in the pudding, and in this case, the pudding is bones. Mmm, bone pudding. Some researchers have reported on some odd cat skulls belonging to Machairodontine cats, the group to which Smilodon belongs, with holes in them that were attributed to the fangs of other saber-tooths. In 1983, researcher G.J. Miller reported on a Smilodon skull from Pleistocene North America with similar holes. Finally, the skull of a Galiptodont, the giant armadillo relatives, was described in 1981 and again in 2013, with two elliptical holes in the top and front of the skull. These holes seem to match the ones that would be made by the contemporaneous Smilodon. Most recently, and most relevantly, a study from 2019 by Nicolas Cimentoa, Federico Agnolin, Leopoldo Soibelzon, Aviero Chora, and Viviana Buid described another pair of South American Smilodon skulls with holes in them. There are two skulls. One is specimen number MCA 2046. This one is a complete skull and jaw of an adult and was found at the cliffs of the Luján River at Mercedes Town, Buenos Aires Province, Argentina, in the upper Pleistocene-aged Guerrero member of the Luján Formation. The second specimen, on the other hand, is MRFA PV0564 and was recovered by Javier Ochoa in sediments belonging to an unnamed lithostratigraphic unit of Pleistocene age. The fossil comes from the Corralito locality, Rio Tercero Department, Cordoba Province, Argentina. It consists of a skull belonging to an adult individual that lacks most of the rostrum, the snoot. Both specimens MCA-2046 and MRFA-PV-0564 show a similar opening located near the suture between the nasal bones and frontal bones, right about here. In both specimens, the length of the opening is 3 centimeters and their maximum width is 1.5 centimeters. From the top, they are ogival in shape, 
The margins are sunken and lack any bony remodeling scars or sutures. In both specimens, the back half of the opening is slightly slumped toward the left side of the skull, and the holes are surrounded by a depressed area of bone, but no distinct thinning of bone is evident. In the MRFA PV0564 specimen, the skull shows a more recent fracture on the left side of the original hole, resulting in a roughly heart-shaped injury. The researchers suspect this recent fracture was due to taphonomy, or how the bone became a fossil. The opening in the MRFA PV0564 specimen shows small depressed fractures surrounding the main hole, indicating it may represent perimortem damage, damage inflicted at or near the time of death. The MCA 2046 specimen, on the other hand, shows irregular and bulging trabecular bone on the margins of the skull, which may indicate bone healing and remodeling. The latter indicates that it was pre-mortem damage or before time of death, and that the individual probably lived for a long time after the incident. That pretty much tells you how tough these kitties were. On the right margin of the hole of the MC2046 specimen, a small area presents vascular-like scarring, characteristic of infection, but lacks hypervascularity in the form of small porous lesions. It lacks the long, thin, projecting spicule bone formations, which are sometimes called a sunburst pattern, and which characterizes some cancerous lesions. It also lacks a lumpy surface resulting from necrotic bone and an erosive surface typical of syphilis. Specimen MCA 2046 shows a funnel-like extension at the right corner of the opening, surrounded by scarred margins of bone. The size, shape, and general features of the openings in both skulls, together with the consistent presence of similar-shaped injuries reported by other studies and researchers, suggested to the 2019 team that taphonomic processes can be ruled out as the catalyst behind the damage. In addition, in both specimens, the bone lacks the typical surface pattern that characterizes some cancerous lesions or other kinds of illnesses. Thus, due to the strong similarities in size and shape, the only thing that could really inflict these holes in the time and place was another large animal with the ability to puncture the skulls of saber-tooths. Since the holes in both skulls are elliptical in shape and singular in nature, it is highly unlikely they were inflicted by a kick to the head by a three-toed liptopterne, like Macrochania and others, by four-toed toxodonts, like Myxodoxodon and others, by two-toed artiodactyls, pigs, peccaries, llamas, and others, or even by single-toed mammals with broad hooves, like horses. Another group of animals that can be ruled out are those with conical teeth. Bears, canids, and other carnivorans have the wrong-shaped teeth to make the type of hole left in the Smilodon skulls. Elephants would be out altogether as their tusks would leave giant gaping round holes, and also such a situation would be extremely rare to have occurred and to become fossilized. The giant ground sloths, with their giant hand claws, can also be ruled out. Though many of them had tall and thin claws, many also had claws that are too wide from the sides to have created as thin of a puncture as that which occurs in the skulls. The best bet for what made the holes would be the sabers of another Smilodon. The size and outline of the injuries in both of the skulls are generally consistent with the sabers of other Smilodons. In fact, the research team took the blade-like upper canines of another Smilodon specimen and placed it within the holes, and it was about as perfect a fit as one could get. Similar injuries have been reported in Machairidus, a relative to Smilodon from the late Miocene. This gives some indication that these sorts of interactions were widespread throughout the entire Machairodontine subfamily. Oddly, many authors over the last century have proposed that the saber-toothed cats the Machairodontines had weak bites and that their canines were not useful for prey attack but solely for intraspecific display. It was argued that, though the blades of Smilodon were heavier than actual blade weapons, they were too slender and would break if used. 
These past researchers argued that the teeth could not be used to bite into bone, and so the animal would specifically target the softer regions of prey, like the throat and abdomen, using its massively muscled forearms to seize and immobilize its quarry before delivering a fatal bite to the soft bits only. More recent studies from the 2000s and onward have shown this to be outdated. Instead, advanced saber-toothed cats such as Smilodon were most likely capable of high bite forces with their jaws and carnassial teeth. The discovery and description of the injured Smilodon skulls and ruling out of non-Smilodon origins indicates further that these cats were fully capable of puncturing bone with their sabers. I would like to point out that it is unlikely but possible that these injuries were caused by humans. A spear tip may be able to make a similarly shaped hole, but I think you would find a lot more clues left behind on other parts of the skulls that would indicate human action. Cuts in the bone, evidence of decapitation, or other indications of carcass processing. This is not observed at all in these skulls. On top of that, I have to imagine that a spear hole would have left behind a different kind of puncture hole in regard to bone splintering and it just, you know, tearing up the bone as it was plunged in or taken out. A thin bladed tooth, like a Smilodon's, would make a slightly cleaner puncture, which is observed in the skulls. Some observant commenters have noted that they have heard about how fragile the teeth of Smilodon's are supposed to be, but if we were to compare them to actual weapons, we should be able to figure out how they would be strong or fragile without having to directly do a whole study on it. Most swords that are shaped like a Smilodon's sabers are strong against force applied towards the blade and towards the tip of the blade, but not forces applied perpendicular to the blade. You can plunge a sword into an object and against an object, and you are not likely to break the sword. If you took the side or flat of the blade and bashed that against a hard object, you are going to be more likely to break it. So, if the Smilodon kept its blades in the prey's body for too long and the prey struggled too much, they may be able to break the sabers due to latitudinal forces, but they were plenty strong enough to puncture or slice through flesh. These specimens then prove they were also plenty strong enough to puncture bone in the up and down direction as well. Whether these wounds were inflicted accidentally while playing or fighting or intentionally through combat remains a mystery. These wounds do pop up in living big cats as well, sometimes from males attacking females, intra and interspecifically. Just sort of a thing that happens when you have some of the strongest bite forces of all the terrestrial carnivores and like play biting each other. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, hit the bell icon for updates, like this video, and drop a comment in the comment section below. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to my elephant tier patrons Arda, Bayer, Biotiverse, Christoph Hubbinger, Dinosaur, Isaiah Garza, PA Brew News, Ray, Rudy Redgrave, Smiling Walrus. And another thanks to my Tyrannosaurus tier patrons, Iberospinus, Iron Bladesman, Swaffles is Weird, Teeny Dragator, The Dogman, 